Hi, Uprivers. It's Gene Hackman Request Week. Thank you very much for all your Gene Hackman requests. We've popped them on Ray's Rotated Review Randomizer and it's selected Narrow Margin as nominated by Simon, Julie and Last Legs FC. Narrow Margin. Never heard of it, but uh, here we go. Yeah, it starts with some sinister music. Narrow margin. Written and directed by Peter Himes. Uh, it rings a bell, that name, but I couldn't quite place it at the start. But yeah, it opens with Anne Archer playing Carol Honeycutt, who's going on a blind date with some lawyer. Now, I don't know the name of this actor, but I recognise this actor. The bloke who plays this lawyer is always playing dodgy characters. So straight away, I'm thinking, this bloke's a wrong one. This ain't going to go well. <laughs> I know how you feel. Blind days can be a bit grim sometimes. Now, if you're out like me, you won't be able to hear the phrase blind date and not think of Silla Black. Ladies and gentlemen, it's blind date. And here is your host, Miss Silla Black. It always sounds to me like that voiceover bloke added an extra D in. Blind date. It didn't sound right. I mean, obviously, he's a professional, he's enunciating better than me, but it did sound odd. Blind did a date. <laughs> oh, God, I couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand Silla Black. Sorry, rest in peace, Silla, national treasure, but uh, Denise watched it every bloody week. And it was the same every week. You'd have three contestants, one of whom was invariably dressed like an arsehole and was the character, yeah, the funny character. And then you'd have somebody the other side of the screen who asked them questions before the producers made him inevitably pick the arsehole. And then they'd go on a blind date and come back and tell Silla all about it the following week. Oh, God, it was shit. Only saving grace for it, Silla didn't sing. Oh, I can't be doing with a singing voice. Like fingers down a chalkboard for me. National treasure, national treasure. Number two, how would you react if I smash your new car on the first day you had it? I'd kill you. <laughs> Bloody hell. I think that was some nervous laughter there. Which of these three arseholes is a serial killer? The decision is yours. Bloody awful. Anyway, I've digressed. I hope you don't mind my asking, and believe me, I'm thrilled that you did, but why did you accept a blind date? Ah, yes, yes, she's on this blind date with this chap. But he gets a message that he needs to take an urgent phone call in his hotel room, which does sound like a ploy to get her up there to have a tough with him. But she goes up there with him. And while she pops off for a poo, evil crime boss Leo Watts pays him a visit. Yeah, they duped him. Uh, it weren't really a phone call. He popped in in person. And Watts, he ain't happy. Because it sounds like this lawyer fella has got him sent in a bit of a pickle. I took some funds from the Con Amalgamate account. I... Now, for those of you who like movie trivia, Con Amalgamate, that rang a bell for me. And after speaking to my lad Dino... It reminded me that Con Amalgamate appeared in two other films that I've reviewed, both directed by Peter Hyams. Yeah, Con Amalgamate is a shifty mining organisation in uh, Outland, what uh, Sean Connery has to investigate. And also, they turn up in Capricorn 1. The good people from Con Amalgamate delivered a life support system cheap enough so they could make a profit on the deal. Works out fine for everybody. Con Amalgamate makes money. We have our life support system. Everything's peachy. Except they made a little bit too much profit. We found out two months ago it won't work. So, yeah, Con Amalgamate seemed to be the default shifty organisation for Peter Hyams in his films. And it appears as though this lawyer chap has been siphoning off money from the shifty Con Amalgamate in this film. But... Thankfully, it looks like Leo Watts is the sort of chap who can forgive and forget. Even though you betrayed me and I trusted you, I would never harm you. Oh, that's a relief, isn't it? That is a relief. Not least for Carol, who's been hiding in the bog the whole time. Well, Michael, I lied. <laughs> oh, surprise, surprise. Surprise, 
no, 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 get her off. National treasure, national treasure. Uh, yeah, unbeknownst to, to Watts and his uh, sidekick, Carol has witnessed the whole thing. And while she preferred to keep her head down, so she doesn't alert the bad guys, unfortunately, she's left some fingerprints at the scene at crime. And an astute police sergeant manages to link the prints back to her. We ran those prints through the federal computer. Turns out they belong to one Carol Hunnicutt. She was arrested for disorderly conduct in 1981 in Oregon. And then we meet the Deputy District Attorney, Robert Caulfield, played by Hackers, yes, Gene Ackman. Now, you know I mentioned that Peter Iams recycled the name of Conor Malgamut. Well, he also recycled the name of Robert Caulfield, because in Capricorn 1, Elliot Gould played a reporter called Robert Caulfield. I mean, they were playing Elliot Gould, but they were called Robert Caulfield. And road Caulfield wants to get out of Carol to get her to testify against Leo Watts so they can nick him. Apparently they've been trying to nick him for years, but ain't been able to. I think because he keeps bumping off witnesses. But Carol's done a runner out to some Bob Ross-style log cabin in the middle of nowhere. So Caulfield and Police Sergeant Bente ride a chopper out to the middle of nowhere so they can pressure her to testify. But no sooner have they arrived than a second, more lethal chopper turns up. Oh, yeah. Well, that didn't stay secret for very long, did it? Leo Watts has obviously got his insiders everywhere. Because how did he know they were there? Thank God they're all OK. Oh, dear. And road, after Carol and Caulfield managed to do a runner out the bog window, as a thrilling chopper chase, as they're pursued through this Bob Ross-style wilderness and try to evade the hit men. But they're in the middle of nowhere, yeah, there's choppers just hounding them, they're not going to get away from it. And then they spot a train, and think, oh, if we can get on that, we, we might evade them, uh, and have an opportunity to keep on running. Keep on running. Keep on no, 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 bloody hell. Rest in peace, National Treasure, National Treasure. And we're about half an hour into the film by this point, and it's rackled along at a cracking pace. No shortage of incident. But this is where it really picks up, because they get to the train station and get on the train. But we see they're pursued by the bad guys, one of them wearing very pointy shoes, almost like winkle pickers, eh? Uh, and they belong to James B. Sicking, famous character actor. Uh, and the other bloke, who I don't know, but we saw him bump the lawyer off earlier. And of course, the baddies get on the train and all. So we've got Carol and Caulfield trapped on a train, trying to evade these hitmen uh, and come up with ever-ingenious ways of avoiding being detected. And most of Caulfield's strategies involve harassing fellow passengers. This is our compartment, not your compartment. I would like you to leave. I'll be honest, I'm surprised he weren't arrested for being a pervert or something. <laughs> But Caulfield is a smart cookie. He knows that Leo Watts has got associates everywhere. And whilst he recognises the two hit men, he suspects that they've got somebody else helping him. They've got somebody else on the train, besides the two guys. So which one of the other passengers is a hired killer? Here's a quick reminder. Is it the jovial, overweight chap who Caulfield struggled to get past in the train carriage? Or is it the conductor? Always oh, skulking about, and he's got the keys to every compartment. Or maybe it's the elderly bloke who gave up his and his wife's compartment for Caulfield and Carol. The decision is yours. I, I think I know what it is. It's a big fat guy. Well, there we go. Will it be proved correct? I ain't going to spoil it for you, because I've never seen this film, uh, and I'm guessing some of you lot might not have seen it either. But yeah, it's worth the watch, this. So yeah, I'm going to try and avoid giving any major spoilers away. But it really did rackle along at a cracking pace. No dead time in this. And there's a thrilling crescendo where Caulfield and Carol are getting chased on the roof of the train by the baddies. And they're on the train! They're doing it! They're on the train! No green screen here, as far as I can ascertain. Good on them! Always amazes me when you see some of these stunts with folk on trains. I know I've mentioned it plenty of times, but Connery in The First Great Train Robbery, unbelievable to me how he got up and did all that. Not least because they made him do it wearing a nickel Norman Wisdom cap. 
So fair play to Ackers and Anna Archer for jigging about on the top of a moving train and all. Good on them. And fair play to Ackers for doing an action scene with no trousers on. Yeah, well done, sir. Okay, do on to raise ratings. Well, as I say, I had never heard of this film, so my expectations weren't high. But in the same breath, it'd been recommended by a few ravers, and you lot have normally got pretty good taste. And Ackers is in it, so you know, I'm hoping it'll be at least a three-star film. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I did. It didn't waste any time getting going. Just got straight into the action. And it was very tense, very exciting. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Ain't going to win any Oscars, but for what it is, it was very good. So I'm rating, narrow margin, a four-star, three-star film. Yeah, I'd look at the running time of this, and it's a lean, mean 97 minutes. Which is perfect, you know, you can just watch that of an evening. Sometimes when I'm looking at the running times of films, it lasts like two and a half hours. And I ain't got time to be sat there watching a film all night long. Oh, bugger off, bugger off. Rest in peace, national treasure, national treasure. Mm. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of Narrow Margin Ravers. And if you did, poke the old like button for me. Give it a good old poke. Or maybe kick it with your pointy James B. Sicking boots, if you've got some. Uh, yeah, and remember to share our reviews with your mates and subscribe to my channel if you ain't already a subscriber. Very much appreciated. Great to have loads of new ravers subscribed as well. Welcome aboard, everybody. And thank you for all them wonderful comments you keep popping on. I do my best to try and respond to them all, but apologies if I don't get around to it, because there's just so many these days. So, yeah, thank you for that. And copyright box permitting, I'll be back with another review for you very soon. So I will see you next time. Okie-doo!